So we explained early the Golders Tunes and the complication of Golders Tunes. So we have another scenario which one of the you know, possible complication during the surgery as well. And the imminent need for going to theater immediately. So the 34 year old female patient uh, has undergone an open cholecystectomy uh, for necrotizing cholecystitis. So basic, basically, necrotizing cholecystitis, that means the, the, the gallbladder has been completely necrosed and uh, that will lead to sort of um, biliary peritonitis as well. So it's a quite serious condition. Uh, blood pressure is decreasing and heart rate is increasing as well. So that tells you that this patient is in um, sort of sepsis and the patient is in reverse and they're in her position because obviously you mentioned that she's pregnant and that we need to put the patient in the reverse and Durenberg position during the surgery to give us some space to access the gallbladder and remove it. Uh, with combined and epidural an, um, anesthesia, and the operation is taken longer um, duration than expected. Um, what are the benefits and risks of um, patient undergoing surgery under these circumstances? So, so one, we have the benefits, and then we have the risks. So the benefits are we're trying to clear up the infection from the abdomen and preventing the patient to see sepsis. And on the other side, the risks can include um, having high risk of DVT because for two reasons. One, this is a major surgery. And two, the patient is pregnant and in hypercoagulable state. And also there is a risk of preterm labor you know, with any sort of injury to um, the uterus or anything like that. And also there is another risk of intrauterine death it could be from the anesthesia or uh, the stress of surgery as well. So um, that will need a multidisciplinary team interacting and dealing with this condition. Obviously, we're going to need a general surgeon to deal with this. We're going to need an obstetrician to be attending in theater. And following the surgery, the patient will need to go to HDU or ITU um, with an obstetric care as well. And um, finally, we can need a neonatologist as well, specifically um, uh, if the patient is delivering. How to manage this case post-operatively, or sorry, where to manage this case post-operatively, like I, I said, it's an obstetric HDU or even ITU. Uh, blood pressure is decreasing in this patient. So yeah, if you remember the scenario, we mentioned the blood pressure is decreasing and the patient had necrotizing cholecystitis. There could be multiple reasons for decreasing the blood pressure. Sepsis would be the whole mark. However, we need to understand the basics of uh, uh, the blood pressure and the cardiac output before coming to this conclusion. So cardiac output equation is uh, equal stroke heart rate. So stroke volume uh, multiplied by heart rate. And the stroke volume is, uh, defined, uh, is determined by two things. The end diastolic volume, which is the preload, minus the end systolic volume, uh, which is the afterload, all right? The afterload. So basically, the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that um, are in the ventricle at the end of diastole, and these are called the preload. The preload can be determined by so many things. So it all depends on the venous return, all right? And the venous return and the intrathoracic pressure. So let me take this down there. Uh, so we mentioned that cardiac output equals stroke volume multiplied by heart rate, all right? So stroke volume is determined by end diastolic volume uh, minus end systolic volume, all right? So the end diastolic volume, it's the amount of blood that are in the ventricles at the end of the diastole, and these are determined by the venous return and also the intrathoracic pressure. So venous return and intrathoracic pressure. So we have here venous return and intrathoracic pressure. Okay, in terms of venous return, the venous return depends on, on so many things. All right, so one, the patient position. So usually if the patient is lying down with their leg higher than the level of their heart, that will increase the venous return. If they are standing, uh, so, the, so the, the venous blood will struggle against resistance, so that can decrease the venous return a little bit. So that's why, ideally, when a patient has low blood pressure, we get them lying down and elevate their legs just to increase the venous return. The other thing is the muscle tone, all right? The muscle tone. And the main reason why, if you have like, if this is a vein, so the vein will have amount of blood inside it, and these are trying to travel against gravity, and you have some muscles from the outside. So these muscles, specifically the calf muscles in the lower limb, act as a 
pump and they like contract and compress these veins to push the uh, blood upward. So the muscle tone also determines that. Uh, so we can overcome this by sort of giving the patient the um, TED stocking. So they need to have the surgery while they have the TED stockings in, unless they are contraindicated. And this is why TEDs are very important to decrease the risk of venous stasis and consequently the risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. All right. Also, we need to talk about the venous tone, uh, the venous tone. And the venous tone can be easily controlled by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, if you remember that. And we know that the uh, uh, um, aldosterone uh, can cause vasoconstriction to the veins and artery arterioles. Um, and also, uh, we mentioned that it also causes you know, the uh, reabsorption of sodium and so on, which is going to be mentioned, I think, later on. Great. So we talked about the position, the muscle tone, and also the venous tone. Uh, and finally, the uh, intravascular volume of the blood. So basically, if you have like a smaller volume of the blood inside, that means you're trying and the muscles are working, the tone is working for venous and the muscles. And um, by itself, you have a very few amount of blood uh, if you've lost the blood or anything like that. So that will decrease the venous return. So that's one. On the other side, we have the intrathoracic pressure. And this is determined by the respiratory cycle. So during inspiration, during an aspiration, uh, the intrathoracic pressure decreases and this increases the venous return. All right. So this is the end diastolic volume side of things. And um, the end systolic volume on the other side, again, this is the amount of blood that are present um, uh, inside the ventricle at the end of the systole. And these are determined by the vascular, the, the resistance that it can meet or the outflow tract obstruction of the heart, the outflow tract obstruction of the heart, or the outflow tract status. So, so basically, if you have a patient who has aortic stenosis, they will have a very decreased, uh, I mean, quite increased end uh, systolic volume because they have vascular resistance for aortic stenosis or maybe coarctation of the aorta, which is a congenital condition. And finally, hypertension as well can increase the end systolic volume or, or increase the afterload. So our main target is to increase the preload and uh, decrease the afterload to make the heart working effectively and pump as much blood as it can. All right. So on the other side in here, so let me just move this a little bit to this side. So on the other side of things, we have the heart rate, all right? So the heart rate is basically determined by the ability of the heart to contract regularly. So we're talking here about electricity and um, um, the ability of the heart to contract. So for example, if you have a patient with atrial fibrillation, that's not really effective. If you have a patient with any sort of arrhythmia or um, if you have a patient with an inotropes. So basically what we can do, we can give our patient inotropes to increase the heart rate. Um, um, yeah, so these are basically the cardiac output, which is equal to stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. So in our patient, um, we mentioned that this patient is one in sepsis. So sepsis can lead to decrease in the blood pressure. And we put the patient in the reverse Trendelenburg position. That can again because in reverse in Dillenburg, you're not actually the position, you're not actually elevating uh, the leg or anything, it's actually down. So you're worried about decrease in blood pressure. All right. And finally, the, um, and finally, the, I mean, basically that we explained everything, uh, the, the patient will have decrease in the preload and um, the, pre, the afterload might not be increased uh, but mainly the patient had decrease in the preload for these reasons, including sepsis and also reverse Trendelenburg position. So we define the preload, which is the end diastolic volume. And according to Franklin's, Frank's Tarling law, so, so basically if this is the ventricle, uh, so within limits, uh, ventricular distension can increase the, the, the amount, the, the ability, can increase the cardiac output or the ability to heart to pump the blood outside. But this, this happens with the limits. So the, the, uh, the preload needs to be adequate amount, not excessive amount, because excessive amount can lead to weakness 
in the muscle and not very few amount because again that will decrease the cardiac output. What can be done to improve the preload? The preload. So we mentioned a few things. So we said the preload depends on the position. So we can put the patient lying down with leg elevated. We talked about the muscle tone. We can put some telestocking for the patient. And we also uh, talked about the, um, so we talked about the position, the muscle tone, and the vascular tone or the venous uh, tone. So we can give our patient vasopressors, which will increase the va preferred vascular resistance and consequently increase the venous uh, return uh, as well. Uh, inotropes will be really for the heart rate rather than the preload, but you can also uh, mention it here. And we can make some sort of manual uh, left uterine displacement because the uterus can be compressing on the veins and consequently decrease the venous return. So what is a shock? So we define this multiple times in pathology section. So it's a circulatory failure resulting from inadequate organ perfusion. So the organ is unable to meet the metabolic need. What will the, be the body response for decreased blood pressure? We sort of mentioned a few things to that. So when you have a patient with low blood pressure, so we explained that cardiac output is a stroke volume multiplied by heart rate, and it's a stroke volume is end diastolic minus end systolic volume. So what will happen? We'll try to increase, so the body will try to increase the stroke volume, and we'll try to increase the preload, and we'll try to decrease the afterload, and we'll try to increase the peripheral vascular resistance to also uh, cause sort of uh, increase in venous return. So we're going to have a few response. So we're going to have autonomic response, hormonal response, and reflexes. All right. So autonomic response, hormonal response, and reflexes. So let's talk about that. So you're going to have like autonomic response and also hormonal response and reflexes. Okay. So in terms of hormonal reflex uh, response, you're going to have two things. You're going to have a release of mineralocorticoids which is aldosterone or activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And this can lead to two things, vasoconstriction to the veins and arterioles, all right? This vasoconstriction can, like we said, for the arterioles, that will increase the peripheral vascular resistance. For the veins, that will increase the venous return or increase the venous tone, which will increase the venous return. And both will participate in increasing uh, the venous return. And this is why, for increased peripheral vascular resistance, this is why the patient, the shocked patient, will have cold and clammy peripheries, right? On the other side, it can lead to salt and water retention, salt and water retention to increase the intravascular volume. Remember, we mentioned one of the, of the things that can increase the uh, venous return is the intravascular volume. So this is for aldosterone or renin angiotensin aldosterone system. On the other side, you can have the catecholamines released from the medulla, and catecholamines, the adrenal medulla, can lead to vasoconstriction of the arteries, and that will further increase the peripheral vascular resistance. On baroreceptors, in the anatomy section, we talked about two receptors in the body, the chemoreceptors, which are pH sensitive, and the, the baroreceptor, which are mechanoreceptors, and they are present in the aortic arch and on the lower end of the carotid sinus of the internal carotid artery. So present on the aortic arch and in the uh, carotid sinus. And they are both very responsive to a stretch in uh, um, the arterial wall. So with decreased intravascular volume and the stretch, this can lead to uh, sort of stimulation uh, or decrease the uh, inhibition of the parath parasympathetic uh, uh, system because it's usually these reflexes are, uh, these mechanoreceptors are supplied by uh, parasympathetic through the glossopharyngeal nerve. The autonomic response, again, that will be increased vasoconstriction to increase the vascular, the peripheral vascular resistance. So these are the three things. It's very important to understand uh, this basic terms of the cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate, and the basic physiology of controlling a blood pressure. So we have autonomic response due to decreased um, the preload, which uh, causes drop in the cardiac output and the arterial pressure according to Frank Starling Law. And we mentioned Frank Starling Law very briefly. In terms of reflexes, we have the baroreceptors, which are mechanoreceptors present on the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. These will increase the stroke volume and the peripheral vascular 
uh, um, resistance as well or preferable vessel construction and this can increase the cardiac output. We talked about hormones. These are catecholamines and mineralocorticoid. Mineralocorticoid can lead to, like we said, vasoconstriction of veins and arterioles and also um, as well salt and water retention. All right. And the other side, catecholamines from the adrenal medulla, um, this will increase the peripheral vascular resistance due to vasoconstriction. All right. So these are the basic understanding of physiology of blood pressure. Great. So we talked about baroreceptors. These are mechanoreceptors present on the aortic arch and the cardiac sinus, and they sense the pressure by responding to change in tension in the arterial wall. So any sort of a stretch or a stretch or relaxation in the arterial wall, it will be stimulated. They are supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is parasympathetic. What are the factors affecting venous return? We explained all of this very uh, in detail. So we talked about the blood volume. We talked about the muscle pump or the muscle tone and the posture and the venous tone and also the intrathoracic pressure, which will decrease with inspiration and that will increase the venous return as well. Can I name a device that can use the mechanical DVT prophylaxis? Uh, one device that we know is the uh, TED stocking, the thromboembolic deterrent stockings, and also the intermittent pneumatic, pneumatic compression. And again, all of these can increase the venous return because they are sort of increasing the muscle pump and consequently can increase the venous return. Thank you very much.